So again, thank you very much for uh, that kind introduction and the um, uh, possibility to speak here, to give a lecture. Um, I will actually give two lectures during that uh, uh, week. Um, and um, I decided to split it into two different, quite different topics. Um, the one that you mentioned on supersolids, the dipolar gases and so on, I will give on, uh, on Wednesday. Um, and today I will uh, speak about another uh, field where we are active, uh, and that is Rydberg atoms and molecules. Um, so today I'm going to introduce that field um, to you. And uh, as this is a school, uh, please, uh, you know, consider this to be a lecture that is introductory in uh, character. And uh, it contains a few uh, recent results, but the, the main intention is um, to familiarize uh, you also, mostly hopefully the young people in the audience um, with uh, Rydberg atoms. And in particular, I will focus on their interactions, the strong interactions that make them so interesting um, for all kinds of applications from quantum computing to quantum simulation to uh, quantum optics uh, with single photons, um, but also to chemistry new kinds of chemical bonds have been discovered. Um, and even, you know, charge transport measurements uh, through quantum gases and so on, as you will see um, during that uh, presentation. So um, uh, let me start by showing the picture of uh, Johannes Rydberg, who uh, was a professor in Sweden at Lund University. And he is my sort of most famous for uh, the uh, uh, for his uh, Rydberg formula that you're all familiar with, um, describing the uh, excitation uh, spectrum in the hydrogen atom, <clears throat> and there's of course the Rydberg constant in front of this uh, famous formula here. And of course, you know, at the time um, that was pioneering work, you know, that led to the quantum mechanics. Um, in the way we uh, know it today. Now, of course, you know, Rydberg atoms are a very hot uh, research topic even today. Um, and, uh, you know, there are a lot of pioneers in that field. Um, I'm just mentioning Tom Gallagher here because he has written a, a, a very important uh, textbook. So if you want to read more about Rydberg atoms, um, mostly about the single atom aspects, about the Rydberg spectra and, and the, you know, the various shifts and, and the, you know, the spectral properties of Rydberg atoms. I can highly recommend um, this book by Tom Gallagher, one of the pioneers uh, of, of Rydberg spectroscopy, also with cold atoms. Um, but I also can mention, of course, many other pioneers like Pierre Pillet, for example, uh, that have shaped this field in the very early days of uh, cold atoms, laser cooled atoms as they came up. So uh, Johannes Rydberg was uh, working at Lund University in uh, Sweden. Uh, here you see actually a building. Uh, this was where he had his lab on the campus in, uh, in Lund. Um, and uh, you know, I, I have this picture because I had the pleasure to give a lecture there um, in that building um, in 2016, and you find uh, the picture of, of uh, uh, Rydberg everywhere on paintings uh, and pictures on the wall. So it was a great honor for me uh, to speak in, uh, in Lund uh, at the place where all the Rydberg physics um, in a way has started. Now, <laughs> coming to our uh, activity, um, this is the campus where I'm from. That's uh, in Germany, Stuttgart University. We have a campus outside the inner city. You see these two big buildings here and where the arrow points here on the fourth floor <laughs> on the right side of that building is where we are doing our Rydberg um, uh, experiments. In the, and this is also the, the building that you see in my Zoom background right behind me. Um, so I wish I would uh, be able to travel to see you guys in person. 
um, because my experience still is, you know, that the lively discussion that you have with people in person is so much uh, more intense than what you can do uh, in a Zoom meeting like this. But uh, I would like to ask you to interrupt me anytime if you have questions um, or comments. Um, you know, I will try to also make breaks in between and ask you for questions whenever, um, you know, you might have them. Um, so, I mean, in this lab, I'm working with a great team of people and I'm mentioning right in the beginning because afterwards I will might maybe forget about this. Um, this is our, our team and we have a lot of activities as you have uh, heard, we are working on dipolar gases, we are working on Rydberg atoms. Um, and actually, most recently, we also started the quantum computing activity using um, uh, Rydberg uh, atoms. And so if you are interested to join this team, we are hiring PhD students and postdocs at this moment. As like in India, there is a large push for the field by an investment by the federal government, in particular in quantum technology, um, also using Rydberg atoms in particular for quantum computing. And we are sort of building the first German Rydberg quantum computer in Stuttgart uh, based on this kind of funding. So what is uh, the topic of my lecture? It's a lecture, as I said, and I thought I try to introduce the interesting things about Rydberg atoms. And these are the interactions that they actually have because they are extremely strong, as you can see, as you will see. Uh, the Rydberg Rydberg interaction is where I want to start with, because that's the physics of the so called Rydberg blockade or the physics behind that Rydberg blockade that makes this a strongly interacting quantum many body system, if you like. Uh, but I mean, I thought I introduced this kind of interaction uh, to you uh, in, a, in, a, in the first part of that talk. In the second part, I will then move on and uh, discuss the interaction of a Rydberg atom with a single ion. And uh, you know, this ion is, the, is producing, of course, an electric field. And as we will see, these Rydberg atoms are very polarizable, very susceptible to electric fields. And therefore, there's not only a Rydberg blockade, but also there is an ion blockade so that the Rydberg excitation can be completely blocked if there is a single ion around. And I will describe that kind of interaction that is even stronger than the Rydberg Rydberg interaction <clears throat> in the second part. And at the end, I will then also uh, report on uh, the interactions of Rydberg atoms with ground state atoms that you might have uh, around in a dense sample like a Bose Einstein condensate or even in a vapor cell. Yes, you will have. Um, a background gas, let's say a buffer gas, or you know, just unexcited atoms. This green guy is one of them, ground state atom. And then we will learn that this electron, this Rydberg electron, actually has a strong interaction with this ground state atom, and that gives rise to new binding mechanisms, the so-called ultra-long-range Rydberg molecules. And so, if I have time at the end, I will um, describe those uh, to you. By the way. If there is someone keeping the time, please give me warnings if I'm going over time at the end. Um, so to introduce Rydberg atoms, we are going to first discuss single atom properties before we go to the interactions, just to get you familiar with uh, the typical scaling laws uh, that we have in Rydberg atoms. The first thing is the size. The size of a Rydberg atom is huge compared to everything else we have in the atomic world. And it scales with the so-called principal quantum number, which counts the numbers of excitations um, to the square. And just to give you an example here, we have a 43 S state, which is N equals 43 state. It is already on the order of 160 nanometers, um, basically in radius. That's uh, 3,000 times larger than a normal atom would be. This A0 is a Bohr radius, the typical length scale. Rate, yeah? And in, in, in contrast to what you would think of an excited atom, naively, the lifetime of those atoms is relatively long. And it actually increases with the third power um, of this principal quantum number. So this lifetime gets longer and longer the higher you excite it. 
And <clears throat> the typical lifetime of that 43, just as an example state, is on the order of 100 microseconds. That gives you ample time to do experiments. Yes, that can happen, let's say, on the 100 nanosecond time scale. Yes. In addition, they are very susceptible to electric fields, and that is expressed by the polarizability. That polarizability is usually negligible for ground state atoms. I mean, uh, lab electric fields are usually static ones, at least are not strong enough to polarize them such that you get a sizable Stark effect. But in the Rydberg state, as, this, as we will see, this polarizability scales like the seventh power of the principal quantum number. And if you go now from, uh, from a ground state to a, uh, let's say, 43S state, you can see that with one volt over one centimeter, you can shift the uh, uh, Rydberg line already by 10 or 20 megahertz, which is, of course, something that you can easily observe and use. Okay. So if we talk about the radius of Rydberg atoms, really what we are talking about is, of course, the, the, uh, of course, the wave functions. And here I'm plotting what you all know, I hope, um, the basics basically of the, of the hydrogen wave function. If you are increasing the principal quantum number in that first uh, uh, entry here of that uh, triple of the quantum numbers n, l, and m, then uh, you see that the uh, outer turning point of the electron, in this case of an s state, yeah, the l is zero here, um, uh, moves out with this power law n squared, okay? Um, and if you go on with that and you go to very large principal quantum numbers like n equals 100 or even 200, which is what we can access in our labs, really. I mean, we do experiments up to n equals 200 in our lab. Then you see that this radius goes all the way up to four micrometers, yes? That's a huge object. It can be even larger then, then, for example, a Bose-Einstein condensate itself, which means that you can prepare a situation where the Rydberg electron spends most of its time outside the condensate while the ionic core sits inside that uh, uh, condensate. Okay, so the rule of thumb uh, for you to remember is the n squared law. And if you have n equals 100, that's the red curve here, you see that the radius is about one micrometer for an estate. Yes, so that's the rule of thumb. Yes, if, if someone asks you what is the size of a Rydberg atom, you should answer one micrometer for n equals 100. And from there on, you can just use the n squared scaling. Okay, um, this is just to compare to other things. Of course, these days viruses are <laughs> important, of course, and you can see that four micrometers here, you know, uh, brings you in the range that is much larger than those. Uh, Viruses, it's actually even larger than some bacteria that we have. Yeah. Um, now let's talk about the lifetime. Again, we are looking at our example state 43S here. Um, what can such an excited Rydberg atom do in order to decay? Well, one thing is it can go undergo spontaneous emission back to the ground state. And here you see the transition rate to different uh, manifolds, basically, of the excitation spectrum. And the largest probability to come from 43 back to the ground state uh, is shown by that bar here with a transition rate of about 5,000 per second. So that is spontaneous emission of that huge Rydberg atom down to the tiny uh, orbital in the ground state. And as this overlap integral is so small, this is actually not a very big rate here, yes. However, there are other states. You can go to the n equals, in the rubidium case, to the n equals 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and so on. And if you care about the total lifetime due to the spontaneous uh, emission back to any of those states, you have to integrate uh, over those blue bars here, yes. And there, if you do that, you end up for the 43S state with a spontaneous lifetime of about 100 microseconds. However, there is a second process that is possible for Rydberg atoms, at least if there is a finite temperature uh, in the environment. And that is to get excited or de-excited by a stimulated process um, that is stimulated by blackbody radiation. Yes, 
because the neighboring states in um, uh, have transit well are only separated uh, in the frequency range between uh, 100 gigahertz and a few terahertz typically um, that's exactly where the black body radiation already provides thermal photons and therefore if you start in the 43s state here you can get excited to even higher principal quantum numbers by the absorption of those thermal photons or you can get stimulated uh, by the by the uh, by these black body photons to lower lying states and these are the red bars here that you find in that histogram and if you are uh, integrating this uh, these decay options that basically take your initial state 43s to some other state um, then you end up with a similar um, lifetime due to lifetime limitation due to black body induced depopulation and if you take those two things together then you see that this uh, 43s state will live in a normal thermal environment at room temperature for about uh, 50 microseconds okay so it's always important to keep in mind that at least in the normal cold atom experiment that is not using a cryogenic uh, uh, environment as some people do but it's a lot of more effort then uh, the lifetime of uh, rutberg atoms you know uh, grow with the principal quantum number and it, there is a difference that uh, depends on the presence or uh, absence of uh, black body radiation as shown here and you see that if you go to n equals 80 for example with black body radiation you can reach a uh, uh, a lifetime of a, of about 200 um, microseconds it depends a little bit on whether it's an s state or a p state but that's the order um, of magnitude all right so that gives us ample time to do interesting experiments. Yes, hundreds of microseconds. Yes. Um, there's another important thing that we need to understand about Rydberg atoms, and that is the concept of the quantum defect. <clears throat> if you compare the excitation spectrum of a hydrogen atom here on the right side with the excitation spectrum of an alkali atom, and rubidium is just one example here, then you see that the um, um, excitations are actually shifted um, with respect to hydrogen. Um, and that shift can be grasped by a so-called quantum defect, which is well known for the alkalis. And you find the numbers for the different L's here. Um, <clears throat> and what does this number tell you? Well, it tells you that the real core of the rubidium atom is not a singly charged proton as in the hydrogen case. It is a singly charged inner shell that is shielded by the inner electrons. But you know the ground state is the n equals 5 state. So that means there are four fully filled uh, shells inside already. And if you have an S state on the left side here, then your electron will eventually dive into that uh, charged cloud uh, and experience um, uh, more charge than just a single charge if it has some probability to come near to the nucleus. And therefore, the n equals 5 um, ground state here, for example, is already shifted with respect to the hydrogen n equals 5 state by a substantial amount. And this is exactly expressed by this quantum defect delta that depends on the orbital angular momentum L here. Yes, So it describes effectively the sh shielding of certain uh, uh, orbitals uh, by the inner shell electrons. Yes, But it, you see these are not integer numbers. So that means now that while in um, uh, hydrogen, there is a large degeneracy of any excited state. You know, all the L states are uh, more or less degenerate here in hydrogen. This degeneracy with respect to L is lifted um, due to the um, uh, different quantum defects of the different L states. Okay, that's going to be important uh, later on. 
So experimentally, how do we reach the uh, Rydberg states? Well, I mean, if you go through it in, in rubidium, for example, then you see, okay, you can do it, for example, with a two photon excitation um, by a red laser and a blue laser, for example, you can absorb one photon here to get to the P state, the N equals five P state, and then go to any of those Rydberg states, high-lying Rydberg states up here in the S manifold or due to selection rules, also to the L equals two, if you do two photon excitation. You can also go directly from that state to the Rydberg state, but then due to selection rules, you are uh, forced to end up in the P-manifold here, in the L equals one P-manifold. And that laser is actually uh, below 300 nanometers in wavelengths. That's possible, but it also comes with uh, some problems, of course, yes. So most of the experiments use that two photon route there are actually alternative routes. You can also go from that n equals five to um, the n equals six state here first with a blue laser, and then with an infrared laser to the n equals uh, to the ns or nd uh, states here. Uh, these are all alternatives that you have uh, depending on you know what are your specific needs. In a nutshell, you buy some of these uh, lasers. Uh, and what is important is that this final transition here has a very small dipole moment, a very small transition matrix element. And therefore you typically need a lot of power to drive this one here. Yes. Okay, so um, if we now put these Rydberg atoms into an electric field, then we are all familiar with the uh, Stark effect that is going to shift the uh, energy levels um, according to the Stark effect. And uh, probably you have seen that in hydrogen. In hydrogen, due to the large L degeneracy here in the N manifolds, the Stark effect is a linear one, yes? I mean, the, uh, the orbitals are all degenerate and therefore if you apply an electric field, the new eigenstates will already have a dipole moment that can be shifted with this electric field in a linear, in a linear fashion. Okay, now it becomes important if you go to uh, alkali atoms that this is not the full picture because we do have that quantum defect. And the quantum defect means that, you know, uh, the 43S state that we have looked at before is actually not a degenerate state. It is a single non-degenerate state here that is due to that uh, uh, strange number of the quantum defect basically quite lonely here in the spectrum. And we are going to excite with our two photon excitation, either S states or P states. And for the P states, the same is true. They are not degenerate with the hydrogen manifold. And therefore those two states actually have a quadratic, stima, a quadratic Stark effect that grows with the square of the electric field because the electric field will first have to induce a dipole moment. And then that dipole moment uh, can give rise to a shift, okay? So uh, that's important. And the polarizability of that state here uh, now comes with it n to the seven um, um, uh, scaling with the principal quantum number. Now, such a Stark map can be easily experimentally measured. That's some unpublished data here um, where you see we just have a little cell, a glass cell that we fill with rubidium vapor and we just measure, in this case, actually the current across those two electrodes as a function of the frequency of our laser, which is plotted here, and the electric field that we are applying uh, across those two plates. And you can see that there's a quadratic effect, at least for small fields. And then at higher fields, something interesting happens. What is this? Well, if you go back, you can see that at higher fields up in this region here, the hydrogen-like states are coming down in the spectrum and they are crossing that line here. And these crosses basically uh, are actually avoided crossings that you can see here and uh, that lead to a little bit of mixing of these states together. And you, can, you, get, you get these crossing points here um, in this experiment uh, quite nicely uh, visible, yes. So this is just to show you, you know, it's very easy to measure the Stark effect in, in Rydberg atoms. And that's actually what we 
need to do in order to do experiments with Rydberg atoms. Here you see our first uh, chamber where we produced Bose-Einstein condensates uh, 15 years ago, uh, which uh, also led to the first Rydberg excitations in Bose-Einstein condensates. And what you see is that in addition to a normal steel chamber, we had to put electric field plates inside to control the electric field. Because even though this is uh, steel here, you always have some windows nearby where there are charges and so on that give rise to little small electric fields that you want to compensate. So one way to determine the electric field here in the center of your vacuum chamber is to measure the Stark shift. Yes, And here on the right side, you can see a Stark shift measurement uh, as a function of electric field. And note that this time we are talking about millivolts per centimeter. You know, the dimensions are centimeters here. so you will have to control the voltages on the millivolt level to zero out the electric field. And you will have to do that in all three dimensions. OK, so if you can do that, then you can excite, for example, very high Rydberg states like 202 S state is this uh, uh, final measurement here. And you see that this state has a shift. If you, if you apply a, a few millivolts, two, three millivolts, of a few megahertz here already, yes? So that is actually something that needs to be controlled in your experiments if you want to do successful experiments with high-lying Rydberg, um, um, with high-lying Rydberg states. Okay, what's the record? How high can you go? I mean, what's the experimental limit? Well, uh, this is uh, uh, an experiment that was done at Rice University in Barry Dunning's group uh, some years back. Here you can see that they have reached principal quantum numbers all the way up to 400 or above, yes? And you can actually see the reviving uh, frequency um, because that's the distance between those, uh, these, these, those Kepler, um, or be between those states according to the correspondence principle. So there's a question now, as I can see, so please go ahead. At least there's a raised hand. Do you want to unmute yourself? Yeah. I cannot hear you yet, so. Well, there's a question in chat, but I ah, Okay, don't... can you, I, I didn't follow the chat. So what is the... Uh... Uh, yeah, it's not really clear to me. It says you mentioned characteristics of Rydberg atom, polarization, yep. principal quantum number, wave function. But why only Rydberg atoms? Well, that's a topic of this talk. Uh, yeah, 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 <laughs> I would have yeah, said. So, um, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, yes, yes. Rydberg atoms, the name is basically referring to all highly excited atoms. Doesn't matter whether it's rubidium, strontium, hydrogen, you name it. Even molecules have Rydberg states even. Uh, so what I'm telling now is, is the general features of all these very highly excited states. And high, it depends on your taste, what you call a highly excited state. Uh, I would say everything above 20 or so, I would say is a Rydberg state, yes? Okay. Um, I, think that, I think that's all. So perhaps you can proceed with your lecture. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank so you. Uh, um, this, um, so please remind me, I'm not following the chat. So if, if someone can follow the chat, then uh, please tell me that if there are questions. Okay, um, sure, I'll do that. Okay. Um, so here you can see that if you, um, oops, no, I can, okay. If you, if you take the difference between those two um, states, yeah, that's En minus En minus one, sort of that's the, distance between neighboring Rydberg states, then this corresponds to the Kepler time, you know, the orbit time of an electron around the nucleus. And in this case, that corresponds to about four nanoseconds. That's something that you can experimentally even resolve. Yes, you can see the electron moving around that uh, core, basically. Um, okay. So that's the uh, world record, I would say, by Barry Dunning's group in uh, Texas in, at Rice University in strontium atoms. Um, why didn't we reach that? I mean, we reach uh, up only up to 200. Well, the reason is we are doing this in a very much smaller box here. 
Uh, they are doing this on an atomic beam experiment. I've seen it once. It has uh, tens of centimeters dimensions. And the name of the game is, again, the control of the electric field, the residual electric field, uh, which in their case is much better uh, possible because they have a huge box. In our case, <clears throat> that box here has centimeter size only because it also has a uh, Bose-Einstein condensate actually inside and some uh, optics nearby to do a high resolution imaging. And that limits our electric field control to a fraction of a millivolt per centimeter. And therefore in our experiments with Bose-Einstein condensates, we are limited to a principal quantum number of about 200, I mean. Um, okay, so let's summarize that single atom Rydberg part and ask for questions at this point if there are any. I mean, uh, this was just to set the stage for uh, non-interacting Rydberg atoms that we know what we're talking about. Are there any questions at this point? Um, I think there's one question. Um, do AC stark shifts yes. uh, from the exciting lasers matter? Yes, they, uh, yes, they do, but they are not much larger than the uh, than the usual ones, actually, yes. Um, actually, um, you know, you can consider this electron here um, of the Rydberg atom. Let me just, oops, my pointer is sort of frozen here. I cannot move it anymore. Sorry, the, uh, sorry, my computer is sort of uh, having a problem right now. Okay, now. Here we are. Um, this electron here basically can be considered as a free electron almost. And uh, that, uh, if you uh, shine a laser on that electron, it undergoes a so-called uh, ponderomotive motion. And that gives rise to an additional shift. Yeah, that has been investigated. And that has to be added if you are working um, in, a, um, in a laser field, yes. So what I was describing was just DC Stark effect. And uh, the question is a very good one. There are also AC Stark um, effects in a laser field. Yeah. Um, there's one more question, uh, or maybe two more actually. So yes. what is the experimental procedure to measure the Kepler time? Oh, uh, here in this experiment by Barry Dunning, it was not measured uh, directly. They just measure the excitation spectrum here and they see this distance. And what I told you is then I um, um, inferred sort of the um, Kepler frequency from that distance here only, yes. But I'm, if I'm not mistaken, they have also done direct observation. And what you need to do then is you need to prepare a wave packet that is really um, uh, spinning around. But uh, yeah, I would have to go back to the to the paper to tell you exactly how they did it. But I think they also observed the um, spinning electron wave packet around uh, the nucleus. Yeah. OK, so we can take just one more question before you proceed. Uh, the question is, what are the significant differences between Rydberg states in an atom versus in a BEC, pros and cons? Uh, the Rydberg state is always an atomic state. And the question is, what does the BEC do to that uh, Rydberg uh, electron? Uh, when yes, it I think so, yes, yes. And there will be shifts, like pressure shifts that you know from uh, normal spectroscopy as well. And that is the final part of my talk today. Um, there will be interactions that give rise to actually bound states of uh, atoms that are sitting inside the Rydberg orbit. Yes. OK, I guess you can proceed, okay. I think. OK, Thank I, I'm just Thank proceeding. I, I already see that we will be running uh, out of time in the end. So let's see how yeah. far we go. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Rydberg, Rydberg interaction. I mean, that's why many people are interested in, the, in, in this field these days. Um, and the reason can be summarized in this plot. Here's the interaction strength. Here's the interatomic distance. That's a logarithmic, a doubly logarithmic plot. So if you think about the interaction between two ground state atoms, 
by van der Waals interaction, it has a one over R6 uh, uh, potential. Then you see, of course, this is a very weak interaction on that scale that we are talking here, yes? 100 nanometers, one micrometer, 10 micrometers. It's expressed in Hertz, so it's less than one Hertz, so it's totally negligible at this kind of scale, yes? There's a little bit larger interaction between magnetic atoms, magnetic dipoles. Uh, at the one micrometer, it's still below uh, one hertz. So it's nothing that you should have uh, considered in your experiment, yes. Uh, if you consider now the interaction between excited atoms, let's say one excited atom and, uh, and, and, and the ground state atom, then the dipole moment gets as large as uh, typically one dBi or so. Uh, and then it can already be uh, sizable. Typically, as you know, the interaction is on the order of the line widths of the transition if you go to a distance lambda over two pi, yes? That's this blue line here, yes? But the interaction between two Rydberg atoms is orders of magnitude larger than that. That's here shown for 35S, which is actually a low-lying uh, Rydberg state. If you increase the principal quantum number, you can easily move all the way up here. Um, and the task of this part of the talk now is to understand that behavior, starting from a one over R3, falling over to a one over R6 van der Waals interaction. What's going on here, yes? Why is it so strong? And what is the nature of that interaction? Why is, does it seem to be first dipole-dipole at short distances and at long distances, it's a van der Waals interaction? If we have such a strong interaction, you know, that's what you see here in this plot that I can, uh, that I actually took from that reference. Uh, I can only highly recommend that uh, for everybody who wants to enter the field uh, by Mark Safman, Thad Walker and, and Klaus Mölmer. Um, if you have such a strong interaction that is wrong range, it is clearly also tunable as we will see, it is switchable. So if you just excite the atom or de-excite it, you can switch this interaction on and off you can switch it in a conditional way, depending on the state of a qubit, for example. And therefore, it is very important to implement two body gates in quantum computation, yes, and in quantum simulation, yes. Um, it is also responsible for the high optical nonlinearity on the single photon level, as uh, you will probably learn in the uh, lecture by Vladan Vulicic, that is also teaching here in that school, yes. Um, so this interaction is, is very strong and very interesting. So where does it come from? Well, let's go back to the simple physics of a two-level atom first, yes? So here I show you something that is a, is a little movie that shows you as an S state, that's the left one here, and a P state atom that is excited on the right side. And if you put one in the excited state and one in the ground state, and one is on the left side, one is on the right side, then this is not an eigenstate of the system, yes? The system will constantly exchange interaction from left to right. And the way it does it is it takes these initial orbitals that are round and P-shaped, uh, basically dumbbell-shaped, like now, and induce a dipole moment by their mutual interaction. And that's basically a resonant electric dipole-dipole interaction between those two atoms here that you can see directly if you just observe the charge distribution of that orbitals, of these orbitals that are evolving in time. Essentially what you see here, if, if there's a superposition between the lower and the excited state is a superposition between S and P, and therefore the charge has the maximum, allows for the maximum dipole moment on both sides, okay? So then there is a dipole-dipole interaction between those two level atoms that falls off like one over R to the third power. By the way, this process uh, is very well known since many years, and it was discovered or first discussed by Theodor Förster, who actually was a university professor in Stuttgart in the chemistry department, you see the chemistry department right behind me in that building on the left side. And it is this process that I'm showing you here is called Förster energy transfer. And it appears between um, atoms that are sharing one excitation. Okay. Now, if you have two 
uh, uh, if you have Rydberg uh, atoms, the picture is actually quite similar. Yes, than that simple first uh, uh, energy transfer. The situation, however, is slightly different as this initial state, the S state here, can be uh, surrounded by an excited state. It's an even higher excited Rydberg state, but there can also be a lower state. Let's call it the P state at some lower energy, okay? So if I now take those bare states here and I take two atoms, then what I really have is a pair state basis that consists of these two S atoms and a uh, PP prime state that contains one excitation above that S state P prime and one state that is actually at lower energy. Now, if those two distances here are equidistant, then this delta here, so-called first defect, is zero. And this PP prime state and the SS state are degenerate. Of course, there are also the other states, SP and SP prime, but uh, they are far away in energy. And usually this delta here is small enough such that we can consider this to be our new two-level problem. Yes, let's consider that two-level problem here with that little delta in here. If we write the Hamiltonian for that, then we see that this delta appears here on the diagonal. And on the off diagonal, we see this dipole-dipole interaction between the dipole moment that goes up, S to P prime, and the dipole moment that goes down, S to P. That's D1 and D2 here, and it falls off like one over the distance between the two particles with the third power. Now, such a two by two matrix can easily be solved, yes, for its eigenvalues. You see these eigenvalues here um, with the delta included and also that off diagonal term. And for example, now, if this delta is larger than the D1, that, then this off diagonal term, then you can Taylor expand that square root here and you end up with a uh, energy shift and en eigen energy basically that goes like the square of that dipole dipole interaction explaining the one over r6 behavior and um and in the front and, and a factor in front that goes like minus one over the detuning delta here yes so this ends up in a van der waals interaction that is described by a coefficient c6 that contains the two dipole moments d1 d2 to the square uh, and the delta here. And note that the sign of that C6 coefficient now depends on the, um, on the detuning here, yes? Um, on the other hand, if the delta is very small now, um, or the distance between the atoms is very small compared to that quantity, then you can essentially neglect that little delta in here. You can take the square root directly and you end up with a dipole-dipole interaction, okay? So um, actually now this delta depends on the details of your spectrum here, and that depends on the quantum defects as we have uh, uh, explained. And therefore, whether this excited state here is closer or farther away uh, than, the, than the lower state really depends on all these issues about the quantum defects. So the sign of that C6 coefficient can be in some cases repulsive, in some cases attractive. And you should uh, uh, remember, of course, that the van der Waals interaction between two ground state atoms usually is only attractive. And the reason for that is there is no lower P state here. There can only be um, positive deltas. But for Rydberg atoms, that doesn't have to be the case. It can be repulsive or attractive. Okay, now, if you tune that delta to zero, then you end up with a first resonance. Okay, so that means that this dipole dipole interaction uh, is dipolar all the way to large distances. And of course, the interaction strength is enhanced. Okay, now the question is can we tune that delta to zero? And the answer is yes, these are the so called first resonances. Uh, and the way to tune it is to use electric fields because we have Stark effects that can shift around the energy levels, okay? And we can make that delta go away. 
So here you see a, 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 a real example now of how the orbitals look like in a particular first resonance that I'm going to show you. So you see that it looks a little bit more complicated than the original first resonance. But you can again see that you start with some uh, initial state that has a funny uh, orbital, yes, with this little uh, donut shape here, yes. But then uh, as, far, as the time goes by, this left one gets de-excited, the right one gets excited, the orbitals change a little bit, the dipole moments develop, uh, and then this process uh, starts to oscillate. Okay, so this kind of mechanism is what gives rise to a real first resonance. Here I show you this example. There are many first resonances, but that's one that uh, we investigated many years ago, um, starting from the 44 D5 half state, which is, has neighboring states, which are dipole allowed transitions to a P and an F state that are oscillating at almost exactly the same frequency around 60 gigahertz, yes? So if you calculate the first defect for such a situation, then the pair state 44D plus 44D and the 42F46P are only separated by 60 megahertz, okay? So if we now tune that uh, uh, by an electric field, you can see that the pair state is this blue line here and these other pair states can cross that other pair state at certain positions and without going into the detail, we could measure that uh, by just looking um, at some uh, Ramsey uh, sequence that shows you nice interference patterns shown down here. And if you analyze those interference patterns, then you can see at certain electric fields, these three resonances here, these electric field resonances that actually show you that around such a resonance, we can switch from attractive van der Waals to repulsive van der Waals and directly on resonance, we do have a purely dipolar interaction. I don't go into the detail of this experiment, but I hope you have uh, understood now what is the uh, nature of the uh, rydberg rydberg interaction. So <clears throat> if you now have, let's say in this example, a very strong repulsive van der Waals interaction as shown here, yes. Then uh, if you again look at pair states as a function of the distance and you look at the two ground state atoms, then there's essentially no interaction and that is a flat line. There's also no interaction almost between the ground state atom and the Rydberg atom, which is the excited atom E here. So that's a flat line. But between the two excited Rydberg atoms, there is in this example, a very strong van der Waals interaction that is repulsive. So now if you excite your atom with a laser that has a certain line width, gamma, or if, if it has a lot of power, you power broaden that line, then this broadening here defines a length scale, which we call the blockade radius, below which it is not possible, because the lasers are no longer resonant with that interacting pair, uh, to excite that second atom, okay? So that's called the Rydberg blockade, okay? Now, if you think about a ensemble of atoms like this, you excite the atoms uh, by that laser that wants to excite them, then this length scale actually means that the Rydberg atoms have to keep, keep the distance. They have to keep the distance of that blockade radius. You cannot excite another Rydberg atom if there is already one atom. So that's uh, shown here by that little graph. And if you put the numbers, then this Rydberg blockade radius is on the order of 10 micrometers, which is large. And you find in a Bose-Einstein condensate, thousands of atoms inside such a blockade volume, okay? So um, you can try to isolate one such volume. Yes, you, you produce a volume that only has a few micrometers and then ask yourself, what's the quantum mechanical state of the excited ensemble here? Because if you have such an ensemble, you have thousands of atoms, you excite it, you don't really know which one was excited, right? Uh, so quantum mechanically, you have to write down a superposition of, let's say the first atom that you have in your ensemble is excited and all the rest is in the ground state, or the second one is excited and everybody else is in the ground state, or, and then there are n terms, 
if you have n atoms or the last one is excited okay so there is a one superposition state you can call it a w state uh, with this norm here in front one over square root of n that describes that whole object here which contains one single excitation now the ground state of that is trivial yeah it's just a product state yes everybody is in the ground state so if you drive a transition now to excite that guy here then as you have n possibilities to excite it the overall Rabi frequency of exciting that uh, atom is enhanced compared to the single atom Rabi frequency by a factor of square root of n so in that sense this thing here acts as a two-level atom although it contains thousands of atoms uh, it's sort of a collective two-level problem uh, and that's why we sometimes call this guy a super atom yes uh, essentially these are the two important uh, levels that are coupled um, by our light field yes and these ideas about these collective uh, states go all the way back to paper uh, that i cite here um, that is 20 years old so this idea can be tested uh, that was done in the, in the pioneering experiments by, by Antoine uh, Brové, for example, also more than 10 years ago. If you put uh, one atom in your box, then you see the red Rabi oscillation. If you put two atoms in the box, then you see that the Rabi oscillation actually speeds up by this factor of square root of two. And uh, well, that's uh, what is shown uh, here on the right side, that square root of two is exactly the speed up that they have measured. Um, in another paper a little bit earlier even, um, we have measured that for n equals 1000 and we could measure that n equals 1000 speed up. And there are uh, even more papers, of course, by now that have demonstrated this. Now, what is it useful for? There are many uh, uh, um, possible applications, of course. Um, one of them, again, is by Alex Kuzmi here, where he has uh, uh, sh trapped uh, a lot of atoms, ultra cold atoms, in a dipole trap that was smaller than the blockade radius. And he excited these atoms to the Rydberg state and brought this excitation back to the ground state in a four wave mixing experiment, such that this final photon that is shown here actually transfers that W state that you have produced in that Rydberg state back into the light field. And as there is only a single excitation due to the Rydberg blockade, it, it will produce a, a nice single photon source on demand, actually. Yes. And here you see the proof. That's the measurement of the G2 correlation function at zero delay as a function of the principal quantum number. You see that at low principal quantum number, there's no blockade. The G2 is just what you expect from a laser, one. And then it goes down all the way to almost zero if the blockade at n equals 100 is very large. Okay, there are many other experiments, of course, and I, I think you will hear also from Vladan about these kind of experiments. What I want to show you here is that this blockade effect is so strong that it even, it doesn't require even uh, cold atoms. It can even work at room temperature um, in a thermal vapor cell, okay? Uh, so that means you have to build a glass cell that uh, contains these uh, atoms here, and you have to do four wave mixing to the Rydberg state, just like in this Kuzmich paper. And that will lead to a single photon source where the single photon comes out on demand in a direction um, that is uh, given by the uh, phase matching of the three other laser fields. Okay, so the experiment was done like this. We used a, a wedge cell, a glass cell. Actually, you can see a picture of that glass cell here. You can also see Harald and Robert uh, making glass cells here with a flame. Yeah, that's actually nice experimental physics. And you can see that this glass cell here shows some uh, Newton rings. So it has a distance between two glass plates that is on the order of the optical wavelength. So smaller than uh, one micrometer even. And that is smaller than the blockade radius. And therefore, if you focus a laser beam into that wedge cell, you can isolate a single super atom, as we call it, inside that uh, wedge cell here. Yes. So uh, that's the experimental setup. Yeah, it's pretty simple. You just put this uh, glass cell between two uh, focusing lenses here, and you do your four-wave mixing. 
Actually, we did this experiment with rubidium, and here you see at the 32S state how the interaction potential actually really looks like. It has a, a nice van der Waals repulsive interaction all the way up to five gigahertz. Yeah, um, that's important because in a vapor cell you have a large bandwidth, and um, the uh, blockade will only work if this potential is clean all the way up to the bandwidth of your experiment. For example, if you would do the same experiment with cesium, you could already tell it will not work. Yes, the blockade is not perfect here. Yes, and the, and that has to do again with the quantum defects that in cesium are uh, just almost uh, integer for the S state at least. Okay, so now you can do that four wave mixing. I don't uh, go to the detail of that uh, uh, experiment. Everything is on the nanosecond time scale, as you can see here. Um, <clears throat> and we can produce that G2 measurement again and show that yes, we do get a G2 that is clearly below 0.5. That's sort of the limit that you have to reach uh, in order to demonstrate that you have actually made a single photon source based on the Rydberg blockade. Okay. So here you see that we can measure that G2 also as a function of the cell length. So we just measure it at different positions in that cell that is wedge shaped. So we can increase that cell length from let's say half a micrometer to one micrometer. And then you see that the, the blockade actually goes away and that single photon source doesn't work anymore. Okay, so that basically concludes my part on the uh, Rydberg-Rydberg interaction. I hope I showed you that these are really strong interactions. Yes, uh, Even in thermal vapor, like at ambient temperatures, you can use that strong rydberg rydberg interaction to produce a quantum many body state like this w state and you can read it out uh, in order to generate uh, a single photon yes and of course if you do it with cold atoms it works even better uh, and that's where you of course then for quantum computation and so on want to get also the extremely high fidelities that you need in order to compete with other platforms are there questions up to this point um, about the Rydberg Rydberg interaction? Um, well, I don't see any questions on the Rydberg Rydberg interaction. Oh, no, no, I think there is one. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, okay. Why are the lasers uh, that are used in the four wave mixing experiment in the nanosecond scale? Yeah, that's a very good question. Let's go back to that. Um, the, the, here you see the nanosecond time scale, and here you see the three laser pulses that we had to apply. Uh, the reason is that in a thermal vapor, if you are working with different wavelengths, you have Doppler effect. And the, the Doppler effect um, determines the bandwidth of your experiment and therefore also the time scale of the dephasing. So if you think about this excitation as a so-called Rydberg polariton, it will have a dephasing time um, that is given by the atomic motion. And if you have uh, atoms moving uh, at rapid speed, like 300 meters per second or so, as you have it in a vapor cell, then this uh, dephasing time of that polariton is on the nanosecond time scale. And therefore your experiment has to be faster than that. You have to be faster than, than this uh, uh, decay of the Rydberg polariton such that you can actually produce it and bring it back down to the ground state, okay? And that's the big difference between this experiment and the experiment that I showed you in Alex Kuzmik's group where everything could be done, let's say on a hundred nanosecond time scale or even microsecond time scale would be sufficient uh, to do it, yes? So if you want to use the Rydberg blockade, you have to be faster than the atoms move. That's the take home message. And for this kind of uh, application, you have to use nanosecond lasers and therefore the bandwidth is large and your blockade potentials as shown here have to be clean and nice all the way up to several gigahertz. Yeah, because if you do a nanosecond excitation, your bandwidth is already one gigahertz here. Yes, did this answer your question? I hope, yes. There are more questions. 
Mm, I think that's all. Okay. Okay, so the final part of my talk. Oh, but now I see uh, there are only a few minutes left. Okay. Uh, is about the Rydberg chemistry. So that's about the interaction of Rydberg atoms with ground state atoms. Okay. Um, you know that the electron is, of course, bound by the ionic core, by the Coulomb force, but then the electron can also interact with this ground state atom here, yes? Um, and we will see that this gives rise to a new binding mechanism that is actually different from the ones that you typically read about in your chemistry uh, textbook. It's neither ionic nor covalent nor van der Waals, yes? Um, and historically, this has, you know, it's a pretty interesting history, yes? Um, if you go back to the 30s in the last century, yes, uh, where people did uh, Rydberg spectroscopy, you know, with old fashioned spectrometers, photographic plates and so on, then you can see already a Rydberg series in these photographic plates here. And you can see that they have done these experiments with uh, with buffer gases in a, in a, actually in a discharge lamp. And if you look at the Rydberg line shown here, then if you put the buffer gas, they saw that this line is actually broadened and also shifted in this case downwards, okay? So they have analyzed in these papers, you know, by Armaldi and Segre in 1934, that if you increase the pressure, then that shift is uh, uh, increasing, yes? And it does not depend on whether you do this Rydberg experiment with uh, potassium or sodium. It only depends on the electronic state or on, on the electron. That's what it wants to say to us, yes? And then basically this slope here is different for different uh, buffer gases. They did it with argon, nitrogen, helium, hydrogen, and so on. And they saw there are different values for that pressure shift. It's a pressure shift, basically. Um, now the interaction we are already familiar uh, is the interaction of the electron now with a polarizable buffer gas atom, for example, a ground state rubidium atom. And it goes like we have already seen, polarizability divided by two times R to the four. Now in the context of the explanation of that experiment in 1934, yes, uh, the other Italian guy, Enrico Fermi, who was then still in Rome at that time, um, was explaining this finding of his colleagues by introducing scattering theory as we know it today, yes? He introduced the concept of a scattering length, AS here, and the concept of a pseudo potential, which, uh, you know, has a form of a delta function essentially um, with the prefactor that gives the strength of that. And that is the um, scattering length, okay? So, um, you know, the, the interaction, the range of the interaction between the electron now and the ground state atom in units of the Bohr radius is, is a few tens, yes, 18 in this uh, particular case. Um, and so that gives rise to those uh, different uh, shifts here, yes. So there's a well-known effect, a pressure uh, shift um, that we know since many, many decades, yes. Now, the, the question now is, um, what happens um, if we not only look at the electron, that's what we look at if we do the spectroscopy, but if we also look at the ground state atom. So what, what happens to the ground state atom? And there was this paper by Chris Green, uh, Dickinson and, and Hussein uh, Sadikpour in 2000 that was predicting that there should be a new bound state um, if the uh, ground state atoms are actually trapped inside, um, inside these potentials here, yes? Here you see a Rydberg wave function, that's the Rydberg electron density with its nodes and so on. And then that's the electron density multiplied by the scattering lengths with these prefactors gives a potential for the ground state atoms. And if you quantize, quantize that, you end up with um, vibrational states that you see um, in these um, uh, in these potential wells, yes? And if you now do spectroscopy, 
and you have a good resolution, then you should be able to resolve those vibrational states here. Okay, now oh, there's more uh, theory. Let's look at the spectra. Um, here you see a Rydberg spectrum around the 36 S state and you see on the red side here on the left side, there is a lot of structure. And this is exactly the vibrational uh, spectrum of these Rydberg molecules, yes. Now, uh, there are lots of different uh, mechanisms at, at play that give rise to these discrete levels here. I don't want to go into the detail due to lack of time, um, but I do want to tell you that if you now put these atoms in these states and you measure, for example, the binding energy of that ground state here, and you change it as a function of principal quantum number, then of course, as you are increasing the electron density here, yeah, you just reduce the size of the orbital with uh, the right radius goes like n squared. Therefore, the volume goes like n to the sixth power. And if you look at the density, the density actually increases with n to the minus power minus six. And that's exactly the power law that you can observe here in the binding energy of that ground state in of a ground state atom that is sitting um, in that um, in that Rydberg orbital. Now, if you look care more carefully at this spectrum, then you can sometimes also see a peak at exactly twice the binding energy. And that happens at high density. And that means there's not only one atom sitting here, but there's a second atom sitting here um, that is also bound. And that would be a trimer. And we can measure all those trimers. And of course, if you continue that and you plot it now in a logarithmic scale, you can not only see trimers, you can also see higher polymers, if you like. Um, here, uh, uh, and, and, and if you then increase the principal quantum number, then the binding energy of those states basically reduces. And what you are left with at high principal quantum number is again, just an unresolved spectrum because those vibrational states are sitting so closely spaced together that you end up with a pressure shift and broadening, just like in the old days by uh, Amaldi and Segre. Yes. So this stuff up here at high principal quantum number is not really new. Yeah, that's uh, the physics of the 30s. But if you go to lower principal quantum number, you actually start to see that there are these vibrational states and you can uh, study them um, and you know do all kinds of molecular physics study uh, 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 the alignment, the Stark effect, and so on. We have done all these kind of studies. Um, um, but there's a smooth connection between looking at dimers, trimers, and uh, tetramers here to the shift you know, at higher lying uh, quantum numbers where this binding energy, uh, where, this, um, <clears throat> the, where you cannot resolve basically these vibrational states anymore. And you go over to that old um, shift basically in um, uh, a pressure shift in, in these discharge uh, measurements. Okay, um, I'm just checking my time. I, I think my time is up, is it, is it right? Yeah, I think. Uh, More or less, yes. So let's, uh, let's look at the uh, uh, outlook of that part. Of course, I showed you that uh, with this, uh, um, you know, Rydberg ground state interactions, you can generate new molecular bound states. The electron wave functions have funny shapes as shown here. Uh, that's, uh, that's very nice. Uh, you can do not only two and few body physics, but you can also do many body physics. Um, these molecules do have a very large uh, permanent dipole moment which is interesting. For example, you could use <clears throat> these uh, molecules to dress uh, a dipole moment to a normal atom and thereby generate dipolar physics. And of course, there's also many body physics involved. If you are now exciting a Rydberg atom inside a BEC, one question is, do these interactions generate phonons? Can you uh, investigate phonon mediated electron-electron interactions um, in the presence of a, a quantum gas as a background. 
Or can you, like shown in this simulation, even image a Rydberg wave function of a single Rydberg electron by the back action of the electron on the, on the atoms? Uh, can you do Rydberg quantum optics? Well, Vladan will talk about this. Or can you actually generate experimentally circular states that where the electron is just orbiting around a positively charged Bose-Einstein condensate? Uh, these are just some uh, fancy questions that I want to pose at the end. And thank you for your attention at this point. And I'm asking for more questions um, um, about uh, the content of that lecture here. Thank you. OK, so thank you very much, Professor Fauf, this uh, really excellent talk. And I'm sure we all look forward to your next lecture. So um, yeah. So uh, I don't know if there's time for one question or something. Or shall we move on uh, to the next? I think we can move on. I have, yes. a, I have a small question, if that's, that's OK. OK, yes. Uh, so have you detected these uh, dimers or timers using your iron microscope? or? Not yet with the iron microscope. No, not yet. Uh, we have not uh, seen the spatial structure yet, but we are working on this right now. Yes. And and, and what, what is the interest in this kind of like di uh, tetramers or timers? Are, are there like fundamental questions that can be answered by looking at these uh, timers or tetramers? Is there any? Yeah. So I mean, from the molecular point of view, molecular physics point of view. You would like, for example, to see dynamics in these uh, molecules, how they are dynamically uh, responding. Uh, for example, seeing wave packets uh, that are oscillating. I don't know whether you consider this a fundamental question. Yeah. Um, um, but there are also more deeper questions about this molecular physics concerning the Born-Oppenheimer approximation that we always assume here. But at some point, this Born-Oppenheimer approximation actually breaks down. Yes. And then uh, we, we could look at what uh, actually happens uh, with this uh, microscope to see yeah, this breakdown of the Born-Oppenheimer approximation. That's of interest for molecular physicists, of course. Yes. If, you come, if you are more a many-body physics person, then I would say what is most interesting for you is the Rydberg dressing uh, mm -hmm. of, uh, uh, of ground state atoms with molecular states because not only can they have dipole moments, they can also induce three-body or four-body interactions. So interaction terms that um, you know, are, are not easily accessible by other means, let's say. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Okay, that's, so this brings us to the end of the, uh, the first lecture. So once again, Professor Fau, thank you very much for a Really okay. excellent talk. And as I said, we all look forward to your next lecture. Yes. See you on Wednesday then. See yeah. you then. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Yeah. Bye.